This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. But I think what, what so struck me this time, and then from what you're saying here about how the narrative can't sustain itself, I'm so struck how uh, in just every moment, including uh, on the part of her husband, George, where she is, you know, she's supposed to be the good woman. You know, Paul's supposed to be the good woman. And uh, everything conspires uh, to make her equivalent uh, to Rose, and I think that's so markedly so uh, when he wants to take a picture of her in the chaise lounge there, and you know he wants her to profile. show her profile. You know mm. he wants her, and he's also asked her about you know uh, you know why can't you wear a dress like that, you know, and just over and over. It's not just not just the repetition of their being placed in the same way like both of them prone so often. I mean, you asked us to watch out for that. But just, yeah, I'd like us to think together about all the ways in which it, it tries to make her equivalent to Rose. Or tries not to, but can't help it. Tries not, that's what I meant. Mm. Tries not to, but can't help it. And mm. is that what you meant by the narrative can't sustain yes, itself? Yes, absolutely. But also, it certainly seemed to me in the last 20 minutes of the film, which are incredible because Monroe's gone, right? I mean, it's not quite like Psycho where uh, the lead, you know, disappears in the, in the shower scene and nobody, I mean, it made the shower scene so terrifying because nobody thought she'd be killed off in the first 15 minutes of the film. Mm -hmm. It's famous Janet Lee in Psycho. This is 20 minutes, not into the film, but before the end, but they do kill off the star. Seems to me from that point on, the sexual passion is between Paula and George, mm -hmm. right? Which is to say him grabbing her in Niagara Falls, the fact that she knows the secret, him walking into her bedroom, her lying on the bed, uh, him putting his, her hands, his ha hand over her mouth, and in fact pretending to be kissing her when I think, in the falls, when I think it is actually her husband who walks past at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so their relationship becomes, and then they escape together onto the falls. That's what you're meant, you're meant mm -hmm. to be getting wet. You're meant to be bathing in the water. You're meant to be having the experience together. Who really has the experience together? It's those two. So I think the sexuality proves less manageable than the conventional trailer narrative of the dangerous temptress who send men up to the top and down over the side. I think it's more interesting than that. Yeah. See, when I see this film, I am so haunted by everything else that you wrote about Monroe. And I just, I, I just wonder if there's any moments in the film when you think that, that Monroe, or maybe just some extra textual knowledge about what happened on the set or whatever, but where Monroe challenged that. Okay, um, she was treated very badly on this set, so much mm -hmm. so that I think it was Henry Hathaway who called out to one of them. He was the director, but he called out to one of the producers, you are not treating this woman as a human being. And Bill Weatherby, in his book, wonderful book, the best thing I read, actually, Conversations with Marilyn Monroe, says that um, Hollywood became like a, a, a cauldron of oppression and of typecasting of women, which actresses like Crawford and Monroe were painfully aware of, and in the case of Monroe, both exploited and fought against. In the article, mm -hmm. I argue that in most of her most famous films, like How to Marry a Millionaire, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and um, Some Like It Hot, she is an absolute genius. And directors who work with her compared her to Garbo and Chaplin, by the way. It's not just me saying this. Um, because she pushes the part a little bit too far and it becomes a pastiche or parody of itself. That's so she makes the stereotype 
a performance. She makes it too much of a performance, so you, you never simply believe in it. The trouble with this role, femme fatale, is the more you prefer, perform it, the more you authenticate it, the more it becomes exactly what it's meant to be. I, you are, the, I mean, the, fa the, the most extraordinary shot for me is when she's about to get in the car with the Cutlers after the death of her lover. And she, no, oh no, she doesn't yet know he's dead. Okay, she thinks her husband is dead at this point. She, gets, she comes out, she's just pretended to be looking for her husband and the bells ring out the song that she's told will play. And she walks towards the camera and she smiles a little bit. And I think, she, I think it's a moment of absolute acting genius mm -hmm. of, I am a beautiful, evil woman. And she does it, okay. But this film, I don't think, is the film you go to if you want her really sending up her parts and really saying, look at this, isn't it ridiculous? It's a shared joke between us. Having said that, and this is a bit of a digression from the film, she was hugely respected as an actress by many of the people who worked with her. So, for example, on The Prince and the Showgirl, the lead, Sybil Thorndike, said she's the only person in this production who knows how to perform in front of a camera. And she wanted to play Grushenka in The Brothers Karamazov. She wanted to perform in Somerset Maugham's Reign, and he wanted her to do it. She wanted to do Anna Christie. When she arrived in England and was being interviewed for um, The Prince and the Showgirl with a kind of press conference with Laurence Olivier, and they said to her, what would you most like to perform? She said, Grushenka. They said, how do you spell that? Okay. <laughs> so that's what you need to know about the way in which her incredible literate and uh, theatrical intelligence was treated with contempt by so many people around her. And it's a partial yeah, answer yeah, to your yeah. question. No, no, thank you for the digression into her, uh, her real life and the lack of respect that she had, although a great deal of respect on the part of many, mm -hmm. uh, always fighting against that iconicity. And I think it's interesting that you say though, that this film isn't the one where you can see her pushing the role to the point of parody and passion. Because the more you do it, the more you fulfill it. Yeah, With this, more, yes. If it's a femme fatale, you can't overdo it. Yes, you know. yes. And um, let's, let's just talk a little bit more about the way war uh, uh, figures in here. Because uh, I think when people, I mean, people don't think of Niagara as being a film about post-war America and the scars on America. But it is. And, and also about how uh, it is uh, you know, going to be uh, whatever saw, uh, whatever problems are going to be uh, solved over uh, by, by burgeoning capitalism. You know, we've got the, the first breakfast cereal factory here, mm -hmm. you know, and just uh, S S Kettler's, uh, what's this, Speckler's, what's his name? The Kettering. Kettering, thank you, Kettering. Uh, you know, just his, his joviality, his bonhomie, his you know, uh, well fellow, well met, you know, I mean, it is, to, to me, it's just one of the most over the top roles here. So there is, you know, and, and of course, George thinks that this is going to be his salvation because he's gotten so much respect for this. It's not George, it's the other guy whose name we've forgotten. It's Paula's husband. Yes. Who thinks he's gonna. Right. It's not George. Right. Right, yeah. Well, I think, I, and I'd love to know what other people think about this, but I, I sort of think that um, this is really a film that is asking the question whether capitalism can redeem war trauma. Mm -hmm. They say, can the healthy, literally the healthy breakfast-eating American couple win out over the war-traumatized psychopath? Um, and the, fa the final scene of the film where you watch all these useless men standing on the riverbank, sort of not knowing what on earth to do and being completely incompetent and useless and the river police having to turn back. But in the end, of course, it's the air and rescue service that comes and picks mm -hmm. Paula Cutler off the rock and the villain goes over the side and it's a happy ending. I mean, that last line, I've never heard scuttle it as a prayer before and have it answered.
that is the last line of the film. So your prayers will be answered, America will be redeemed, and the war-traumatized criminal, pathologized, war-traumatic person will destroy himself, right? So that's what it's trying to say. But I, I'm fascinated to say that you've not, I mean, it's, for me, it's obviously a film in which the struggle over remembrance and trauma versus the new global order of capitalism where you will be happy if you have the right objects in your home. Um, and even rainbow cottages are called housekeeping or something, aren't they? <laughs> housekeeping cottages? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is like, can, how, will good housekeeping save America from the legacy of the Second World War? And if you read... May I just interrupt? Yeah. Organization. Organization twice. Times? Organize no, yourself. Three times it came yeah, up. Yeah. Three times, like people, you need to organize yourself. Oh, he says it to her yes. when she's actually seen. Um, Loomis, and he says, just get organized. You're having a nightmare. So there's another question here as to whether commercial commodity capitalism can redeem, i.e. re-repress the world of nightmare and fear. And she also carries that. Uh, and that's said yeah. about the serial king, too. You know, he would even like to organize his children's pillow fights. That's right, yes. You know, like, so, so this idea of, you know, organization is going to come to this chaos. You know? But it's a form of forgetting. And Arthur Miller, although I have very, very mixed feelings about the way he writes about Monroe in Time Bends, and of course, after the fall, his play about Monroe, although he de denies it, James Baldwin walked out. He was so furious with the representation of her as a drug, a drug, a druggy, neurotic wreck. He was absolutely living. Many, many people were. So I have very mixed feelings about what Miller did to Monroe. <laughs> after, later in his life. Nonetheless, if you read Time Bends, when he says America was in denial, rem Remembrance was out, and we were all meant to be, he doesn't quite put it like this, but sort of like perfecting ourselves in relationship to a capitalism for which the evil was McCarthy. And it was not McCarthy, it was communism. And of course, Monroe and Miller were deeply involved in this. I mean, he was only hauled between the House of Un-American Activities Committee because he had got engaged to Monroe. And then they said to him, if Monroe will pose in a photograph with the head of the committee, we will drop all charges against you. And she refused to do so. And she says in one interview, they told me my career would be finished. But they, they, they stood up to it. They resisted it. So the perfection of America, you know, mm -hmm. Turkey was stuffed with shredded wheat. It, the, the backstory is not just the Korean War. It's McCarthyism. And, and, the, and, and Monroe was deeply involved in the politics surrounding that and, and her abhorrence for what was happening in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be a good time to open it up and hear from you all. Comments, questions. Yes, as I was watching the film, I kept thinking actually uh, about the idea of PTSD, right? I mean, uh, about the, the idea uh, of uh, post traumatic, traumatic stress. stress disorder, because that has always been part of the uh, subtext of the film. It's been that after every American war, there has been a reaction to try to push over the cliff, literally. Uh, all the PTSD men, right? Yes. It, it happened after World War I with My Forgotten Man. We, we even have you know, musicals talking about My Forgotten Man. It happened after World War II. It's inconvenient because it interferes with capitalism. It happened after Korea. It happened after Vietnam, of course. You know, it happened after every war. And we it's are happening now. We are dealing with it now, right? The post-war, the idea that uh, it's inconvenient to have the mm. leftovers of the war mm. because they are the, the traumatic embodiment, mm. literally, mm. right? They carry, you know, this, this, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of unpleasant memory and that interferes, right? And I keep thinking about, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bush doctrine. I mean, after 9-11, go shopping because otherwise, you know, the, the terrorists win. You know, that, that kind <laughs> did of- you, uh, Did you remember that? It's uh, yeah, it actually did. It's happen. burned into our memories. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not making it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
It sounds too bad to be true. You know, but, but, that's, but that's exactly the idea. I mean, mm. it's, uh, uh, the guy has to go over the fall. Mm, of course. Uh, and and he's, you know, the fall is there from the beginning. He's but the, the guilty party one. is not the war. The guilty party is Marilyn Monroe. Exactly, that's the point. right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the point. And also the fact that there is a subtext of solidarity between the two women, as you were saying. And at some point, the, the line that really struck me as the weirdest one is when Paula says, because this is not the real honeymoon, is the one that they had to postpone. And she says, uh, at some point, I have my, my, what does she say, I have my union card. Yes. Right? It's like, and she's talking about marriage. Yeah. Now she's part of the union because she has already tested the marriage. She has entered that marriage. She's not, you know, she's not a newlywed. So with Monroe, who has been married for two years at this point, right? I mean, with the character, uh, Rose, who has been married for two years. I mean, she already is in, has this feeling of solidarity. She never blames her. She yeah. never says, you know, I mean, the, the classic, you know, rivalry between two women, she's too beautiful. No, she's a beautiful woman. She should mm -hmm. wear that dress, right? Mm -hmm. and, and she keeps uh, actually justifying uh, Rose. And uh, she doesn't reveal mm -hmm. that Rose was kissing somebody in the back of... of the well, a handful of groceries, isn't that oh, perfect? Oh, Shredded exactly, wheat. Right? I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the idea. So I thought Ooh. it was really interesting to read this film as an example of this kind of women solidarity, the the, the, the transposition of the two women. I agree with you, there's solidarity, but there's also something more sinister in the way they start occupying the same place as bodies on the floor. So I think both things are true. It's, it's almost as if, if you're going to be solidaritous, no such word with each other, then we're going to kill you. You're both going to suffer. Of course, Paula survives at the end. She has to be redeemed. But there is something sinister about the women are lined up with each other. I noticed that thing about the union card, and I'm in, I think you must be right that it's like, I've earned my dues, I'm paid up member of marriage. But of course, it, it evokes a whole history of labor. And one of the things in this film is not just the reference to the Stars and Stripes, or the Spangled Banner versus God Save the Queen, or they, they wiped us out, the British, in the Revolutionary War, but the reference to labor with the reference to the union card, and of course, as Constance nudged me in the film, the black laborer in the building who just, he's a prop. He's simply mm -hmm. an adjunct of the narrative. He has no role mm -hmm. except to not see what's going on around him and let cotton in and out or effectively out of the building. And actually take the flag down. Yeah, he has out. a big take role. Take the flag down. Right. He's, yeah. he's, uh, he's, he's the, the one, one who puts the flag up and down. Right. Because the flag yeah. technically is not supposed to say out but that, But that, taking the flag up and down, reminds me of one of Roland Barthes' most wonderful essays in Myth Today, in Mythology, where he takes the Paris match cover, which is of a Negro saluting the French flag in a French army uniform. And he says, this image is saying, look at me, I am part of the family of man, I am part of the French nation, there has never been a problem with Algeria or anything else. I say it's a look how we can incorporate the people we are most oppressing in our culture and who are most discriminated against in a narrative about how wonderful America is. It's the same thing. Um, but yes, I think solidarity and then something nasty, I think really does it. I agree, Constance, I'm sure. Oh, no, I'm just fascinated by what you're saying about the PTSD. You know, and here it is, I mean, he is sent over the edge, you know, mm. and, but of course, again, it's the woman who's sending him, sending him over the edge. But just how we disappear, those with PTSD, mm. you know, and are able to have amnesia around that, you know, so that in a film like this, it, it just kind of erupts as a symptom. Yeah. Well, Paul is meant to mend his hand, right? I mean, I think it's very important that she's meant to be the woman who can redeem all this by just loving TLC, basically in a plaster. Um, and of course, it doesn't, it doesn't work because he then breaks up the cabin, um, yeah. And of course, he says to, uh, George says to uh, Paula, did she send you in here to see if I'd cut it off? I didn't want to be too obvious here, but you know. No, and what about the guy who was running the rainbow house, who kept standing around, you know, with a hose pipe? <laughs> and you're thinking, what's all that about? Okay, fine, yes. Yes. Hi, I'm interested in this relationship between noir as a genre and consumerism and capitalism that mm -hmm. you're tracing, because noir is typically a genre that 
is hostile to ideas of capitalism, or it tries to envision as a, as a genre a space in which capitalism has been disavowed. And there is ways in which, you know, this has been studied recently, noir and consumerism not being antithetical to each other. But this movie seems like it's sort of saturated in that imagery of capitalism. I mean, her excuse for going to, um, for her infidelity is I'm going to the market, which is a really interesting moment. And so I just wanted to know, you know, your thoughts on this, this film in particular in tracing that relationship between noir as a genre and consumerism and capitalism when those two in the past have been positioned. Well, I don't feel I can say enough mm -hmm. about film noir as a film that I think as a genre, which you're saying normally disavows capitalism. So I want to hand this question yeah. to Constance. And I'm going to hand it to <laughs> Anna <laughs> Brasuti, who uh, has just done a remarkable uh, event here around film noir. Um, it is actually, I think she's absolutely right, because very often film noir, um, particularly the ones from the 40s and the early 50s, were uh, kind of the smaller picture, the B pictures, right? The ones where uh, there was less control by the studios. And uh, even in the, in the most expensive pictures, like Double Indemnity, you have entire scenes in supermarkets which, you know, the, the entire idea of the conspiracy takes place in a supermarket because that's where nobody, where everybody is and nobody notices. Uh, and and uh, it, it was so, um, it was so uh, kind of contrived of a scene that they, during World War II there were no well-stuffed supermarket. They had to create one. They had to police one so that people wouldn't steal, you know, the stuff around. I mean, so the idea that the contrivance of the uh, imagery of capitalism, the contrivance is very typical of film noir. And you can see it in, in, in many, many examples. I mean, people, you know, uh, seen driving the car. I mean, the car is the status symbol. Um, you know, I mean, again, double indemnity, I, mean, I keep thinking about it, you know, begins with uh, uh, actually a quote of how much a house might have cost. You know, when they finally, you know, this this house would have, t you know, set you back thirty-five thousand dollars or something. And and the whole idea is that this is about American capitalism and how the imagination uh, is working within. You know, it's it's a function of capitalism. It's not a by byproduct. Uh, so I think I think you're absolutely right, and is very much fun to look at the way in which noir traces the aberrations of capitalism. Uh, that was going to be my question to you. So I, I, I think you said di the film noir normally disavows capitalism or, or exposes it or lays it bare in the sort of formalist sense. Maybe that's what you're saying. I mean, so my question would be, is this an exception, this film, in using the noir genre, but stating so clearly the opposition between consumer happiness and fulfillment and sexual danger, I mean, and the war, which we've been talking about, does it, does it, distribute the pieces in a slightly different way? Or is it fulfilling the cliche? I mean, I'd like to send that question back to both of you. Which cliche are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Which, because it's really not a cliche. You have to kind of work through it. It is not you know, something that you immediately notice. Uh, but I think this film is very clear. I mean, what you were saying about the stuffed Turkey, I mean, the invention. How do we, you know, take food, which is very simple, and turn it into something, you know, extremely de non natural, I mean, de denaturated, uh, and, uh, you know, turn it into something that can be consumed and you didn't know you needed it, you know, and, and, and you can buy it. Um, I think it actually fits that kind of okay. idea, fits mm -hmm. very well that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, speaking of, of uh, you know uh, the uh, consumerism, uh, the fact that yes, I mean they constantly uh, they constantly uh, um, uh, kind of address this issue of going to the market, as you were saying. I mean, going and to Niagara the market becomes a consumer object. It is the ultimate consumer object where you go as a tourist, right. and that's what Starkey says right at the end of the film. I realize you've probably had a little, you've had your fill, which is a bit ambiguous, of the falls by now since she swallowed right. a gallon of water, Paula. But don't cross us off your list. <coughs> as if the last bid for the film must be for the continuing viability of Niagara as spectacle and as consumable objects. So, and, and as you well. were saying, I mean, and as, as the trailer was saying, Niagara is Monroe, right? Yes. And at the same time, we're reminded constantly of the, of the feminine present, the mist, 
right? Made of the mist. Made of the mist. Is the boat, right? Yeah. I mean, every time you see the mist, you're thinking about, you know, this kind of uh, this kind of metaphor for the presence of these women. Even and when Monroe disappears in that kind of dry, extremely off-putting high angle shot that does not do anything right to 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 either you know uh, make a sympathetic to her dead body it's a very cold and a very distant shot uh, you see the bells more than you see the dead body i mean how many shots of that bell of those bells were there you know I've, it's, I mean, after a while you go okay i've seen the bells i mean it's okay they're not they're not singing anymore she's dead <laughs> but we see very little of her. And then we go into the ultimate mist, which is, you know, then the third act. I mean, we just go on to do... Okay, we see very little of her, but I think if we saw more, it would be worse. I remember when feminism and film discussions started in the sort of 70s and 80s, where I remember a, a group of us sitting around, a kind of feminist film discussion group, and saying, I'm not sure which is worse, when the woman is in the shot or when she isn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> part of us was struggling for more representation of women in film, with big, and, um, and the other part of us was analysing the fetishization of the female body and how terrible it was. So it was impossible to square that circle. Yeah. So I, t I agree with you, but more of that shot might have been worse. Did you have something to follow up on that? Thank you, Jacqueline, Thank you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.